Well, I was born in, on 9th of November, 1898, when Queen Victoria was still on the throne, had the ordinary classical education that, that public schools provided in those days. And um, in, in my last year at school, which was, it was after the war broke out, of course, but of, yes, well, um, it really uh, hit me so hard that I didn't want to go on living. I, I, I used to get completely stuck and couldn't, couldn't finish the words. Words that began with P or T, I was afraid of, and sort of just to think ahead how I could manage to say them. And what was in some ways worse, word began with S. I could never get from the S onto the vowel, I just sort of saw hissing. <laughs> and I was awfully sensitive to, to how absurd I was being. And mind you, I don't think anybody ever really mocked me or was nasty or. Yes, one okay. One of the masters did get a bit irritated once when I got a bit very badly stuck when we were talking in class. But um, it was a continual cloud over me for all, all for ages, really. Um, it still worried me a bit, mind you. I think that's occasional. You you may have noticed it as it hit somewhere, but it. <coughs> Much later, when I came to start lecturing, it, it was um, it was really the thing I think that made it impossible for me to lecture simply from notes. I practically had to read the lecture, otherwise I couldn't both think of what I wanted to say and how to say it at the same time. It, 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 it rather spoilt my lecturing career if I got a lecturing career. But I felt very much. Um, Oh, we were depressed all that time, I know, rather. Who, who didn't, I suppose, in the, in the, the worst part of the war, 1915 and 16. I got a part-time job on um, a weekly journal called Proof, a very old-standing one. But I, I only attended the office on Mondays and half-Tuesdays. I was paid an appropriately small sum for it. But for the rest of the time, I was free for things like writing or trying to write. It occurred to me, well, why not systematize all this? Not, not, not just bring it out here and then one word here and another one on there. I would um, write, write a general account of, of the, of the uh, way in which words have come to have their meanings. Um, then I started on that, and of course it led to its own train of thought. Of, uh, the way in which the kind of uh, evolution of consciousness that it began to disclose. See, so there is already an implicit th theory of the history of consciousness in history of English words, although I certainly wasn't writing with that intention in mind. And uh, I began to find that I had very um, sharp experiences in reading poetry. Not so much of whole poems, or certainly not long poems, but um, particular phrases, particular lines seem to um, have some kind of, well, if one uses the word magic, I don't know any other, but, it, but uh, poetry was beginning to mean it meant a lot to me, but, but more from the point of the view of particular moments of it than, than uh, the considered uh, critical appreciation of a poem as a whole of the work of art, I think that sort. Especially metaphors, particular metaphors, really. <coughs> Seem to say things to me that nothing else did. And it seemed to be something which was um, untouchable by, by the overriding materialism of my outlook. Um, so I started to write about that. After graduating, I stayed on a year at Oxford to, to get um, a B-Lit Bachelor of Literature, and you had to do a dissertation for that. And uh, I suggested poetry. It had some difficulty because it wasn't the kind of thing that's expected 
of, of a scholar doing a dissertation. You expect him to write about something, um, you know, was well, the third act of Hamlet really written by Shakespeare's butler or something like that. <laughs> uh, and I think that it, it, every graduate who was doing a billet had a supervisor. Um, and I think they finally decided that I, I'd better do without a supervisor, because my, my subject was so odd anyhow that, that they, they, could, they couldn't put one in. So I didn't have a supervisor, I just, I just wrote on. And they gave me the degree all right anyhow. And, uh, I've done a very heavy pressure at my office um, after my father's death. And um, there was also there was some domestic misunderstanding or trouble at home. I, mean, um, I didn't like the job I was doing and I, I think I was really on the verge of a nervous breakdown. And I think writing that book uh, stayed it off. Towards the end of the 50s, I, I managed to get um, or, um, a bit of a remission from the amount of time I had to give to work in the office and could spend some time just reading. And for oh, a year or a couple of years or perhaps more, I, I remember spending a lot of time in the British Museum reading room, doing very desultory reading, totally unconnected things, some anthropology, some histories of science, some um, expositions of modern science, preferably unorthodox modern science. Uh, that sort of thing. I, I had a lot of very scrappy notes, and I tried to get them together into a book, and couldn't find any connection somehow, or any satisfactory connection. I even I think I wrote the first chapter of what I hoped would be a book. I had to give it up. Then I came across this little book by a man called Gavin Ardley, called Aquinas and Kant. And it was in that book that I first read about the origin of the phrase, saving the appearances. And that somehow, uh, round that, all these unconnected notes I'd made, those scrappy notes from, from different parts of uh, the uh, mental world, seemed to crystallize in some way. And so I wrote an article called Form in Poetry which was published in the New Statesman. And it pointed out the form in poetry, the, the, the form which a, a poem created was a form in the consciousness of the poet and his readers, nothing external at all. And that, was, that, that article was published in the New Statesman while I was still an undergraduate. And I suppose really, in a way, you could say that thinking about thinking, um, but that, that, that was the first symptom of it. What I was anxious to point out, uh, what I thought was brought out by these uh, etymological observations was that <coughs> there wasn't just people in the past who, who think like us but have different ideas, but who didn't think like us together at all. That, they had different kind of thinking. <coughs> That, that, that impressed itself on me fairly early, that, which, which of course is another way of formulating the, the concept, the evolution of consciousness. Well, I don't think that, uh, that the mind is something that goes on in the brain. I think the brain was originally formed by the mind, or by mind, not, not any particular person's mind. <coughs> and then use the brain to produce the subjective picture of the world in which we live. Everything pretty well that the ordinary human being, in common with his fellow human being, sees. He may also have hallucinations, things which seem as real to him <coughs> as the collective representations which he shares with the rest of, the, of his contemporaries, of his contemporary uh, society anyhow. A metaphor um, is not the same as the meaning of an individual word. It's something between the two meanings and uh, can only be apprehended by the imagination.
and not by the um, logical brain. But it's not unreal for that reason. The imagination, I suppose I would say, is um, a form form of perception, if you like, of, uh, of a way of apprehending reality um, which cannot be reformulated in terms of logical sequences. <coughs> According to rules of logic and reason, but it's, but it's not unreal for that reason. I, I'm very anxious for the an old, old epithet to be, to be restored and used instead of creative. Forgetive. You ever come before such? F-O-R-G-E-T-I-V-E. -E. Which is, uh, it's, um, it means creativeness, but, but not quite with the uh, metaphysical oh. claim to, to supernatural is creation. This, is this your equivalent of Tolkien's sub-creation? In a way, yes, yes, but it is, yes, yes, yes. Animals have more participation than human beings, and what participation there is is obviously original in the case. But, um, that is, once you explained when I asked why all the ducks did the same thing together, how they knew, you said it's because they have a collective soul. They have a group soul, yes. Group so, soul. So. By flock, by genus, by... Various ways I know. You know. When you see all these birds suddenly decide to leave the roof and fly round and round, all, it can't be that one says, the, come on, chaps, let's go now. And it's, <laughs> it's obviously some kind of mental experience common to all of them. <coughs> you also think participation has altered in time along with the evolution of consciousness. Do you yes, know? certainly, yes. How, yes. how has that happened? How has what was early the well, that's, uh, original participation purpose. between the human mind and the natural world um, was something of which people took for granted was happening. And, uh, that was why they were able to, to, to perceive um, mythical beings and trees and animals and so forth. We still do, as I tried to prove in the opening, pages, I mean chapters of saving the page, we still do in fact participate, otherwise we shouldn't see a con uh, structured world at all, we should just see chaos. But, but we're, we're, we're totally unaware that it all goes on in our unconscious now, what used to, used to happen more consciously. Yes, well what I suggested in saving the appearances was that, um, that we, we had, by rejecting or ceasing to experience original participation, we had become uh, independent individuals in a sense in which our forebears were not. But the cost of that had been that we felt ourselves completely cut off from what used to be called nature and now tends to be called the environment. <laughs> um, uh, and enclosed in our own particular physical body. But uh, by um, developing the imagination and uh, understanding that what our present form of consciousness has emerged from participation, we could get back an awareness of participation, which we, which we no longer have, without losing it our uh, independent self-consciousness. What then is the, is the destiny of humankind? Well, uh, I thought we dealt with that. The destiny, if all goes well, and if they, if they use their free will in the way that one hopes they will, the destiny is um, final participation, which is, which is um, a highly developed garden of Eden, really, I suppose. I don't, I don't know, but uh, I prefer not to go into all that because I think it's beyond me. But uh, all I can say is, m please move in this direction. <laughs>